So listen, you guys, we're talking about black fathers. We're talking about the importance of black fathers. So today I have two important uh, gentlemen here to discuss this topic with me, you guys. So I want to dive into a lot of interesting things. You guys know as an officer, I go in and out of our communities. I go in and out of our homes and our schools. I speak to counselors. I speak to therapists. I speak to defects workers. I have, def I have sent kids off to the state. I've removed kids out of the homes. You guys, and one of the most common denominators Either the dysfunction of the home is so bad or there's absolutely just a father missing. Um, and sometimes there are kids in homes with mothers that aren't qualified mothers and they're there and the dysfunction is there, you guys. There's a multitude of issues. There's a multitude of impacts. We know that there's an attack on men in this country. It's been like that for a while. There's different tools. There's different agendas that are taking place um, and they want to destroy families. Why? Because with families comes power, comes unity, because, you know, culture is grown and it's orchestrated through families. And if you could destroy families, you guys, you can wipe out a whole nation. You make a nation weak. And uh, specifically today, we're talking about black men, how black men become, well, I would say how black boys become black men and from black men, they become fathers. If there's anything in that process that derails that young boy, you're talking about chaos moving forward. And it's hard to get back on that path of truth. It's hard to get back on that path of correction, that purpose, you know, and this is what we're going to discuss today. I want you guys to see the impacts of what it looks like when fathers are missing out of homes. A lot of us don't know this, uh, the data behind it. We don't know the outcomes. Who do I have with me today, you guys? I have the amazing Sir Hale Speaks. If you guys don't know him on my channel, you will learn to love him as I have. You know, I've got a chance to debate this gentleman before, very sharp. Um, he has a voice smoother than mine. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. It ain't that smooth, but it's smooth nonetheless. Um, but he has some wisdom about him. Very sharp. I learned a lot when I listened to him. He has his own channel as well, Sir Hell Speaks. We also have the amazing Chicago Rilla, if you're not familiar with him. He's also, these two men are also fathers. Chicago Gorilla is a very, very, very sharp brother as well. You know, I listen to him speak all the time. He always has something amazing to say. He's always advocating for men. So is Sir Hill. They're both strong advocates for men, black men, of course, and black fathers. And so I felt like these are the perfect two gentlemen to bring on this, uh, this platform to have this discussion. So we're going to also drop um, uh, Chicago Gorilla's link as well. He's attached to this amazing platform called the Peef Network. Um, they be over there talking about all kind of stuff. You know, I'd be over there just trying to keep up every day. It's something new, right? Amazing conversations. So without further ado, I'm going to bring my guest up and you guys, we're going to dive right into it. Go ahead. Uh, Sir Hill speaks. Go ahead and let the people know who you are. Uh, first of all, I am, my name is, my real name is Ernest Hill. I go by Sir Hill speaks. Had to put that out there because this, it just rolls off the tongue easily. I am a proud black man, proud man married to a beautiful woman going on 15 years for beautiful children. I am a man of faith, someone who did not come up through school, never graduated, but got my GED, but then matriculated, went back to go get a degree, finishing a degree. My goal is to help empower people who don't feel like they can be something because of societal pressures. My goal is to bring black excellence, to put that on display and to let black men know that you can be excellent and awesome and to change the narrative about who we are, how we conduct ourselves in society and in families. My name is Sir Hell Speaks, and I approve this message. You know, we got to give that slow clap. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I approve that message. Absolutely. Um, I love it. I love it. All right, Chicago, really, you up, brother? Let the people know who you are, where they can find you. Thank you, sir. Um, yeah, I'm a custodial engineer. Um, I sweep up the streets. I collect cans. Um, I sweep bathrooms, hallways, all days. Right? No, I am. Um, I'm a. I'm a again proud black man. Uh, shout out to Sir Hill. I'm a proud black man. Um, I am pro black everything. Everything that you when you see me get up here, when you see my background, know that that's something black connected to. You see this hat, know that that's something black. You see this shirt, right. lead never follow. Shout out to leaders. It's black. It's all black everything over here all day. Right. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a dude that's passionate. I love my people, man. I love my people. Um, recently married, shout out to my wife who is allowing me. I don't have 15 years in the game, sir. Hell you, you low key flex on all of us. Right. 
Uh, but I've been with my girl for we've been together almost six years, and we just got married um, in February. Um, and uh, it, life is amazing, and life is good. So, look, brothers, we're gonna dive right into it. I want to read something to you to introduce this whole topic, and we're gonna get right to the the, the meats and potatoes of it all. Here we go. In 2008, President Barack Obama said during his Father's Day speech that more than half of all Black children live in single-parent households. Children who grow up without a father are five times more likely to live in poverty and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of school, 20 times more likely to end up in prison. They are more likely to have behavioral problems or run away from home or become teenage parents themselves. And... The foundations of our community are weaker because of it. You guys, this is this is the late, great, still alive, legendary Barack Obama, the savior of black people from the Democratic Party. We are well aware of who he is. This was a statement that he said, right? You guys, what, what a lot of people might not realize is the reality behind this situation is absent fathers has consequences. Regardless of how that father became absent is irrelevant. We can talk about all the nuances. People always love to dive into how, where did it happen? My situation was like this, my situation was like that. Now, not to, not to shy away from that, but the reality of the problem is it is exist, right? It's here, here we are, and there's consequences for it. What people don't realize between 60 to 70% of some of the most dysfunction that children go through, right? The depression that they go through, the suicide, we talk about sexual assault against them. We talk about juvenile delinquency. We talk about behavioral problems. We talk about crime. We talk about poverty. We're talking 70% of these kids are going through this. And one of the common denominators that they found is that fathers weren't present, right? Whether they were active in the child's life or completely gone and missing. I wanna start off with, uh, with Sir Hale. When you hear that statement about Obama, what is your thoughts about black families and how he kind of presented that information out? What are your thoughts? Well, the first thing is that it's true. It is a product of a single mother. And it wasn't because my father left, it's because he passed away. Okay. You see how difficult it is to, and this he passed away when I was five. So you see how difficult it is to, number one, not have that second person, that second perspective about life. And as a young boy, whoever is your most closest influence, you're going to pick up the way you think your template for life based off of that person. So young boys who are around women end up taking on feminine characteristics, the way we think and approach things. One of those key things is the mismanagement of our emotions, mm. how we feel. We become emotional about everything, which is why a lot of kids who start off that way without the male presence the male presses that establishes that foundation end up expressing that emotion in what is anger. So we join cliques, we join gangs, we do things because we're trying to find a way to fit in without having the right template to manage our emotions. And so when I hear Obama say things like this, it, it makes me think about my own life and about some of the situations I find myself in and thinking about how do I want my life to play out? Do I want to be on the block? Do I want to be selling drugs? Do I want, is, is this what I want? Because everybody has to choose. Everybody has to choose. And sometimes, depending on where you live and what you have available to you, those options are diminished. So some people who are, who are living that way, that's the options that they have around them. Um, so when he says this, there is, there, was a, there is an air of truth, but also an air of grief that our community has devolved into such a place where this has to be said at a national level, mm. at a national level, because it has now become our normal. So it's truth, but I, I'm, I'm, it's, it's a little, it's, it brings a little bit of grief and a little bit of gravity to let us know that the situation is, is, is even though we've normalized it, it is, it is serious and needs to be at the forefront. That's what I think about. Okay, well said. Um, and I do have, I do have a rebuttal. I wanna get Chicago. What are your thoughts when you hear Obama make that statement, uh, Chicago? I don't want to be going behind Sir Hale all night, man. <laughs> I got to the next one. So. <laughs> no, no, I'm just, I'm just joking. Listen, I literally got my, I already knew what type of night it was going to be between you two brothers. And uh, I now I'll, I'll forewarn you, um, uh, brother Nathan. Yes, I am 
I am, uh, oh gosh, inextricably, inextricably tied to what we're talking about and deeply passionate. So you'll hear a lot of anecdotal references for me and okay. a lot of nuances because that part I can't get away from. But I believe in what you said also is that the, the whys and the hows and the this and the that, which we tend to focus on, you're absolutely right. In in the greater scheme, it doesn't matter. But at the same time, I do want to, I, because I, I always champion myself as someone who represents blue collar workers, and I always want to consistently connect with them, and that's yeah. one of the ways that I do it. And so, um, similar to Sir Hell, so you know, uh, my my situation with um, my father wasn't a result of him passing. My situation with my father in absenteeism was him being alienated. Okay. okay. And, um, you know, what Obama said rang true. Now, the block that I grew up in or grew up on and the era that I grew up in, it was interesting because it, you know, at the same time, I saw a lot of two parent homes, but there were there were a number of kids that, you know, went to school with that got free lunches. Right. And we know, you know, for the most part with free lunches is, you know, uh, people that fall below a particular threshold with income and tends to come from single parent homes. And most times those are single mother homes. And so, um, you know, when Obama made that statement, this is my honest reflection. When he made that statement, it wasn't I didn't look at it necessarily that it was coming from, you know, um, the president's office. What I wish had happened with that was that there was some follow up and follow through as a result of that statement being made. And then here's the other part of it. And I don't want to do what about isms, but um, I know <laughs> plenty of people on the other side of the spectrum that are experiencing the same thing, too, in terms of Correct. growing up without their father. And they don't quite look like me. Right. They don't quite right. look like me. And so they're kind of experiencing the same thing, too. But I want to keep it centered on what we're talking about. Um, with people who look like me. Um, and so that's that's my honest thoughts um, initially. I just really wish that I agree with the statement, but um, it, you know, in retrospect and hearing you read it, it does kind of sound like virtue signaling because what I don't see is the follow through. And even, listen, let me say this. <clears throat> Shout out to the first family and all that, right? Even with the development that's going on down there on South Shore, um, and in Jackson Park and what they're about to build in terms of his library, right? Mm. There's still an opportunity to impact Chicago and the boys in Chicago. And I feel like that presence should be felt more. So when I hear that statement, I'm a little bit disappointed, even more so in retrospect, because you made the statement, then where's the follow through, right? Where's the follow up and follow through? And then where are the end results that we can point to to say, you know what? Good job. Well done. So it's my honest thoughts. I, I agree. And I think that's the danger of having all this information. You know, when people say the moment you put a mirror up, you're forced to look at the reality of a situation. It's called accountability. That's why we, that's why we avoid it, right? Because the idea that once you see it, once someone tells you about what it is, you have to address it appropriately. I agree with that statement. Um, so Chicago, let me add this real quick. Can we repair it? Do you see do you see us turning this ship around? Is it possible? The beautiful thing, and I say this, I, I'm I'm seeing this a lot lately, just from being in this space since uh what February of last year. So, oh dang, it's almost been a year. Jesus Christ. Right. It's been a year of being in this space. I see brothers, um, man, getting it together. And you know what's the beautiful thing? Um, it's not that I just see it in my inner circle, right? Because we can I could easily be swayed and biased by who my inner circle is, but it's, I see, I'm connect you in the A, um, sir. I forget where you at, sir. Hell, but in, you in the Carolina somewhere, I think. Down here in Texas. Oh, Texas. Okay. So my point being is that otherwise, if it wasn't for this medium, I wouldn't have connected with you guys on this level. Right. And so I, I do see a lot of brothers getting it together. And the reason why, um, uh, brother Nathan is because men are made, men are made. So I do see it getting better. I do see brothers stepping up to the plate. And even in my generation in particular, um, for those of us who abandoned or uh, our fathers were alienated out of the picture, we didn't grow up with our fathers. One of the commitments that we made, and especially in my cipher in particular, I will never be the father to my child that my dad was to me. And I see that playing out. So I do see it getting better. Powerful statement. Um, and I agree with that. 
I always look at the relationship I had with my father. He's still alive. And uh, we have a good relationship, but there are things that I see in him that I wish he was, he did differently. Right. And I think all we can do is take the, the, the best parts of our parents, right. And then add on something greater to it and pass something better on to our own children. That's all we can do at the end of the day. Um, and it makes it so much easier to look at it that way, instead of complaining and being angry about what we didn't have or what opportunities were not presented to us or passed down to us from our, um, our parents. So here, what do you have to think? What do you have to say about that in reference to is this is this repairable? It absolutely is reparable. So I am so honored that dads come in different shapes and sizes. We look different. And what I'm glad to see with, with platforms like this is that we get to see fatherhood in different in different ways. We get to see it in different ways. We get to see it, you know, from different spectrums. I absolutely think that is changing. Let me be transparent for a second. As a father of four children, there was a moment where my wife and I, we had a disconnect. We had a disconnect and we saw how the division between us affected our kids. And we had to make a grown folks decision to say that not only are we in this for us, but we in this so that our kids not only can have the things that we didn't have, because things come and go, but we want them to have some understanding, a foundation that we didn't get to have about what love is, what care is, what family is, a sense of belonging, what nurturing is, what masculinity is, seeing work ethic, seeing unity in the home, seeing how to function with somebody. So it absolutely is reparable if we all make the decision that we're not going to live our life just for our own stuff and what we want to do, but we make life bigger than our own personal endeavors and pursuits. So yes, and I see more men not only doing it, but becoming more vocal about it and encouraging it within the men within the men around them as well. So absolutely, positively, unequivocally, yes. Okay, I like that. I like that. And I agree with you. I, I believe that there are certain things uh, as we are moving um, I believe the fastest way to fix and cure this problem is, is for our community to have its own uh, educational system, quote unquote, right? We know this thing is all about education. What's the fastest way we can reverse engineer the problems that are impacting our community in a negative way? We talk about the influence of media. We talk about the influence of social media, uh, movies, television, rap music, entertainment in general. All these things have an influence, whether you like the influence or not. The reality is we have young children who can't separate the, the, the reality from the entertainment um, and it's having a negative impact. I want to talk about one of the biggest problems as far as black men, the myths of black fathers, right? The myths that fathers are not present, fathers aren't active. We know that black men are the most active fathers in all groups, right? And so what happens, you guys, people throw these statistics out. They say, you know, 70 to 75 percent of um, black women have children out of wedlock and they're 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 single mothers, single mothers. But then they never talk about all the nuances behind the scenes. Um, and so it's a it's, it's a very unique statistic because we know it's a lot, but it doesn't necessarily mean bad per se. Well, we know it's bad. Right. We know it's, it's bad. It's not healthy. Let's say that. We won't say bad. It's not a healthy statistic. We definitely want to reduce that. Is it safe to say that this is a two-part problem? Are we looking at modern times changing so much that people don't look at marriage as something of a necessity, right? Um, or is it that there's just a problem together between both gender, genders coming together and unifying and creating family out of that? Is this a modern day thing and it's not really too much of a big deal to look at? Or is this still a legitimate problem, um, having out of wedlock births and the fact that our single mother rate is so high? Um, who wants to take the stab at it first? Chicago, go first. I, I'll see it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm hearing my grandma all through that. I'm, I'm, you know, my mom, cause my grandma, you know, my, <laughs> I love my grandma. My grandma say stuff like, "You so smart, you dumb." Facts. And the thing of it is, in that generation, it worked. Like we just listened to Sir Hill talk about. You know, he's been married to, uh, and shout out to uh, wifey. I see her in the chat. Um, Y'all been married for 15 years, sir? 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How much, how first. much, how much yeah. of that is lovey dovey and fuzzy and oh baby, it's it's bunnies and I love you just so much. How much of it? How much of that? Two days. <laughs> Two days. <laughs> the point that I'm making is we just listen to him talk about duty. Right. Her legacy. Duty, honor, legacy. That has nothing to do with how you feel. Correct. You know, those questions, uh, one of the first conversations I had with my girl, uh, and what one of the first conversations I had with her is um, we knew we knew early on we was gonna be together for the rest of our lives, right? You know, we just, we just knew it, right? So one of the first conversations we I had with her is, what happens when you don't love me? What happens? Because, you know, you, when you describe love in these spaces, it's a, you know, it's a feeling. It's, it's, I feel. So what happens when you don't love me? What? Like, I don't, anyway, my point being is when you talk about um, duty to family, duty to our children, duty to, um, for me, legacy. You know, the, the, the scripture talks about train up a child in the way that they should go and when they're old, they're not, they'll not depart from it. That people um, misuse and abuse that scripture all the time. But I, I'll just say for me, um, and I hope I'm answering the question, but for me, training up that child in the way that they should go um, requires uh, <laughs> covering requires covering and you know i think in two i think optimally for things to change in our community um for things to change especially with uh as it relates to family and, and parenting and rearing um man we just <laughs> we got to get honest we got to have open, real conversations. We got to get more intentional. And again, I'm hopeful because I do see it improving. Um, but I've never encountered so much like gen uh, gender war stuff until I came into this. In my real life, I don't see it like that. Me neither. I don't see it like that. Now, people are making, you know, some irresponsible and immature choices in real life. Um, and then they have to account for that. I've made irresponsible um, and immature choices, and I've had to account for that. Um, but for me, I, I have to believe, uh, well, I have hope. And I do see it getting better, but we got to get real about these conversations. So I'll pause there and let Sir Hale cook for a bit. So let's get into this. Number one, if you are a single parent in the the, the other parent is active. You then are not a single mother. You are not a single father. You are a single person. And I think that we have to evolve the definition so that we no longer use this. Oh, let's get into the second part, that there is a whole business and marketing strategy for single parenthood. I think what has happened, particularly in minority communities, is we've celebrated and championed single parenthood, which is why you see this as a prefix to somebody who's doing something. This single mother accomplished this. This single mother did this. This single person did this, and it is because we have marketed this in such a way so that big business profits off of the dysfunction at the expense of children. And until we take this back and we no longer allow this negative concept to be marketed to our communities, and we say we're not bonded to this business, and we're not going to use this trope that I am a single parent as a way to bolster my social standing or to make my efforts seem bigger than they are, but that is bigger than that. And no, I'm going to give credit to the other parent who is active because this ain't about me looking good and looking so strong because that's what we do in our community. You're strong. You're a strong black woman. You're a strong black man. No, if the other parent is active, it doesn't mean that they are always available, but they are active. That means that they love the, the child just as much as you do. Whenever there's something needed, you don't have to beg them for that. They try to spend time to the best of their abilities. They nurture that child. They, they try to do what they can. We've got to stop using this I'm a single so-and-so as a way to get the credit when all the credit doesn't belong to you. So it's a marketing problem that ties back into business and the business is profiting off of the dysfunction that we see in our community. So we have to remarket what this means and place value back on the necessity and the structure and honestly, the help that marriage provides for family and children. It's a marketing issue. Yes, 
Go ahead, Chicago. I was going. I was about to ask. So, because I'm thinking about like uh, Nathan, you were talking about earlier about the influence of media and stuff like that, right? So that's the first thing that I go to. Sir Hill, what do you think of some? And I hope I'm not jumping ahead of you. Uh, nah, brother, go ahead. But what do you think of some of the solutions to get back? Because I agree with you. The the idea that being married is like, oh, you you being tied down, and that's a an, yo fam, you. Negroes have no idea. I'm so glad I don't have to play around in that stuff. Y'all have to do. These niggas are doomed. <laughs> like, <what the> Facts. <laughs> Y'all are doomed. Y'all are out there playing with stuff that's just like wild. It's and wild. I, Listen, I, 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 you I, in that I, place, I, so I know you know. You poor thing. <laughs> it, let me tell you something. It is a. It's a. It's a. Where's Chicago go? Or the struggle streaming. The uh, we'll, we'll get Chicago back up. He probably dropped the. All right, let's look at this. This talks about black families, right? Black families living at or below the poverty line. And for those who don't know about poverty, it's basically essentially t discusses how much of the what what are the necessities that's needed for survival, right? How much does it cost per person? to have the necessities for survival. And I believe a single person is like 17,000 a year, right? As long as you make 17,000 a year, you're below poverty, but that's how much you need to make to survive, right? Or to be considered below poverty. And then, so I'm gonna look at what it looks like for two people. And then when you start looking at what the necessities are for survival, and you look at how much a person is making, you'll understand why they make the poverty line at that level. So living at or below the poverty line, all right, so we look at living below the poverty line. We look at 74% are female households with no husbands are living below the poverty line, you guys. This is where the danger is. This is where the danger is. Regardless of how you feel about being by yourself, being a strong, independent woman, a strong, independent man, you know, there's consequences, and it's not about you. It's about the children, right? It's about the children. What do we see for married couples? 16% of married couples, black married couples, are living below the poverty line. What does this say, though? It says that you're better off together at the end of the day, right? You're better off together. The reason why I bring this up, you guys, is because what Chicago Real Estate said is so important. There's a duty behind this. This isn't about our feelings. You know, somewhere down the line, I'm going to bring this back up, so I want to get you guys' thoughts on it. Somewhere down the line, we have forgotten what marriage is really about. What is the purpose? Is it about love or is this about economics? Is this about love or is it about economics? Which one's priority? I would say economics. It's about legacy. It's about survival. Black people, we have to get back in the mindset that this is survival. This is about survival. Sometimes we look around us and we think that things are better than what it actually is. In reality, it isn't, right? On the surface, things look pretty, but below it, things are hard. It's difficult. COVID is bringing a whole new element, a whole new monster to this world, a whole new monster to families. A lot of families were broken during COVID, right? Because we were attaching ourselves to people for the wrong reasons, the duty, the obligation to one another, you know? Um, I want to get your thoughts on, on this, you guys. And I think the problem we have in our community is that we are not looking at marriage and relationships as a responsibility, a way of survival, right? This should be the most important decision that we make in our lifetime is picking a partner. Picking a partner will determine your future and your children's future and generations to come. You, within this timeline, if you pick poorly, could damage three generations worth of families, all because of a poor choice. It's very serious. And I think we've, we've removed the seriousness out of dating, and relationships and in picking people to go the mile, to go the distance. Um, Sir Hale, your thoughts on that? And then I'm gonna pull back up this this uh, this pie chart to get your thoughts. Now, so, okay, so how transparent can I be? I wanna, I wanna ask this question. Brother, you could be as transparent. Listen, over here, we do facts over feelings. Tell the people the truth, they need to hear. Okay, so in our community, what we do is we're focused on penis and pussy. 
Like it's about sex. It's about that and provision. So we are so sexual in terms of the way that we live our lives and relationships are optional because we can supplement the things we need with, Hey, there's programs out here. And the dangerous things is that our, for women who absolutely need assistance. Now let's make this clear. There are some people who absolutely need assistance. Correct. What has happened though is with the availability of assistance without their with, with with structure being removed and responsibility not being something that you know that we talk about, it's just so easy to have everything else supplement your life and so you learn how to survive. I know how to get through the winter, I know how to get through a year. But to live beyond the next few months, to live beyond the next few weeks, and think about not only this next year that I'm living, but the next five years, my college tuition me saving, my investment, my children's emotional development, uh, their social structure, their foundation in terms of who they are as a person. We've become so focused on how much, what, how, how good the sex is, what, 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 what she's bringing, how big her behind is, his size. We're so focused on the external parts because we, we've supplemented what the spouse was supposed to do with government assistance, with programs, when we could find a way to hone in our out of control sexual desires, hone those in and stop living for the next sexual experience we're gonna have or the next pair of shoes we can buy or, or the next uh, the, the, the next the next loan that we can get, the, the next income tax check. We gotta think beyond that and start looking at the next five to 10 years of my life. These government programs might not even be here, but what I can do is put myself in a position to where I prioritize the necessity of family and not just from the perspective that this man can give me what I want or this woman can do for me, but I'm going into this marriage with the mindset of investor, that I'm going here and investing, knowing that my returns might come slow, but if I invest slowly, eventually I'm going to reap a harvest. Until we get to the place where marriage is, is a place where we go to invest, not just for this next year, but for life and for legacy, we're going to be forever talking about the sexual experience we have when we don't own property, we don't own schools, we don't own our future because we mortgaged our future because we lived for now and we didn't set up the restraints and the parameters to have successful relationships and marriages. We focus too much on sex, not enough on structure. I think that's one of our problems. Well, I had to take my hat off. <laughs>